And we are live. Greetings, salutations, and all that jazz. And of course, a happy world ember to everyone. I have a very exciting topic for you. I have a very exciting guest for you, and I really can't wait any longer. Folks, please let me introduce the amazing Laura Ann Gilman. Laura Ann, it is such a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing, and where are you calling in from today? Uh, doing great, considering it is very early on a Saturday here in Seattle on the west coast of the US. <laughs> Although I suppose it's not that early now. It just feels that way. Um, yeah, Saturday yeah, no. morning, bright and early. We are so grateful to have you here. Thank you. I guess the coffee has been flowing. Uh, yes, this is, I think, my fourth cup. So if I start speaking very quickly, just say, slow down. You're not in New York anymore. Uh, I'm, <laughs> We've got you. I'm a We're native New Yorker you. originally. So, yeah. <laughs> And speaking of which, let me introduce you, possibly because, of course, you are far too modest to introduce yourself. Laura Ann Gilman is the author of the Locust bestsellers Sulphur on the Road and The Cold Eye, the award-winning Devil's West trilogy, the popular Cosa Nostradamus books, the Retrievers and Paranormal Scene Investigators Urban Fantasy series, and the Nebula Award nominated The Vine Art War trilogy, which I have been informed is about wine magic. And if that is not on your reading list already, we're not friends anymore, folks. It's on mine. <laughs> Um, her most recent story collection is The Wind, or sorry, The West Wind's Fool and Other Stories of the Devil's West. And she continues to write and sell short fiction in a variety of genres. But her latest release just this week was Uncanny Vowels. It's the set second in the Huntsman series, of which Uncanny Times, this, my current read, is the first. It's Gas Lamp Fantasy, which we will be telling you all about what that means. Uh, I can best describe it as if the TV show Grimm was set in like a Bram Stoker, Dracula era, East Coast America. That's kind of what I've been getting on it so far. I'm halfway through. I'm so hyped. I'm really enjoying it, folks. Uh, if that were not enough, she's a history major trained especially in US political history. And I am so very happy to have her here to unpack what is gas lamp fantasy. All right, Laura Ann. I think we have to answer that question first. We've had people sitting in the chat saying, is it is it some kind of Sherlock Holmes thing? Is it, it sounds <laughs> sounds 18th century? Is it like steampunk? What in a nutshell is gas lamp fantasy? Oh, in a nutshell. OK, this is um, gas lamp fantasy is the term used for a very wide range of storytelling tropes that are the, either set in or emulate both the Victorian and the Edwardian period of the um, of the the English Empire of, of the British Empire, uh, and it is sort of the fantasy sibling of steampunk. So they they use a lot of the same periods, they use a lot of the same tropes, with different underpinnings: magic versus science, and a lot of times you get a mashup of both. I should warn people, I am a native New Yorker. I will use my hands a lot when I'm talking. So I apologize if that's distracting. I'm um, here for it. If you, hold my hands, if you hold my hands, I can't talk. Um, Folks on the podcast, you are missing an experience right here. <laughs> <Go> ahead, <laughs> so when we say steampunk, um, part of, uh, and when we, say, when we say gas lamp, part of my background is I was an editor for 16 years. I did a lot of marketing meetings. It is a marketing term. It is a way for people to identify, oh, it's this kind of thing, but it doesn't have hard and fast rules. In fact, I would say the dominant feature of Gas Lamp is that there are no hard and fast rules. It is a playground where you can bring all your toys in and just mess about how you like. And that's kind of the appeal of it for a lot of us, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, to unpack that a little bit further, you can think anywhere from Jane Austen to Queen Victoria-ish in terms of the kind of ish. time period we're thinking of. Although, as mm -hmm. Laura said, there's a huge amount of leeway there in terms of really what you want to do. It's a it's a genre, right? That means it's a label yes. that is used to kind of describe the wonderful, wacky thing that you have made. It doesn't have to fit neatly in the box. Um, Victorian London is very popular for, for gas lamp fantasy as a, as a location, isn't it? Very much so. In fact, um, when most people think of gas lamp, what they think of are those visuals of the street lamp that is gas lit, that only, sh only casts a little bit of light, as opposed to the electric lights, which cast much more light. Um, and that is really 
indicative of the genre. Uh, and one of the reasons I chose it for the Huntsman series is that there's only a little light cast. As a matter of fact, the Huntsman series is set at the, in 1913, so it's the border between gas lamp and cities becoming electrified. Mm. So you've got one of the appeals of gas lamp is there's often that conflict between what was historically a darker age and the, the first modern age of electricity, automobiles, refrigerators, that kind of thing. So it's very much a turn um, in society. Absolutely. It's a technological turning point, but it's also a mm -hmm. social turning point. Absolutely. Yeah, very much so. Yes. I think one of the really interesting things about this genre is that it's a magical genre, but it's a magical genre that's tied to a particular social and real world technological era, which means that there's kind of three different ways of approaching it. You can either say, OK, but the magic is a hidden world like a masquerade. You can say, OK, but this is a full on alternate history. This is something that uh, Gail Carriger does in Solus. We'll talk more about like what are the different kinds of things that could be considered gas lamp. And then the third way is saying, OK, this is a completely not Earth world. But it just happens to feel like 19th century colonial Europe. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I think. And one of the things that you mentioned there is important is that it is a colonial world. It is a colonizing mindset. It's an empire building mindset. Um, and you have to engage with that however you're going to use it, whether you're going to deconstruct it or you're going to lean into it. I can't believe I just used those two terms. Oh, my God, my academic background is coming out. Um, you need to identify how you're going to approach that because it's there. Absolutely. And we're going to be talking later about the difficulties and the things to be aware of when you're approaching Gaslap Fantasy. I think that's something that's definitely going to come up for me. Um, just for those who are curious, the term Gaslamp Fantasy was coined uh, with regard to a webcomic called Girl Genius. It was a webcomic that won a Hugo Award for three years in a row, uh, 2009 to 2011. Um, and it was then retroactively applied to a bunch of other genres. So if you're thinking, oh, I haven't heard of this genre before, but it's describing stuff that I know, that could be why as well. Yeah, it's, uh, I think I think the term existed before, but it wasn't popularized and it wasn't identified so clearly. And they really sort of said, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that this has already been a question that's come up and I, I do I do love answering questions on this show. So what is the difference between gas lab fantasy and steampunk? They're a similar era. We're talking about similar technological era as well, technological advancement. So how are they different? Um, the underpinnings in a lot of ways. Steampunk tends to have a mechanical element to it. Um, more emphasis on airships, for example, or, or uh, clock punk is another phrase that you might hear. Um, and it's, it's usually a science minded, even if there's magic in it, it's science minded. Underpinnings is basically what you're starting from. If you're starting from a world in which magic is the driving force in which the the royal family, rather than having a chief scientist, has a chief magician. Then you're basically writing gas lamp fantasy. If they have a chief artifice, or you know somebody who's tinkering with with wheels and gears, then you're doing steampunk. Um, but as I said before, they share a lot of the same tropes, and there it's very easy to sort of cross over between them while you're writing if you're not careful. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, steampunk is a science fiction genre. You think of H.G. Wells, you think of, you know, Jules Verne. These these were steampunk before they were called steampunk, right? They they were mm -hmm. writing about the futuristic tech of their time, which for us is now historical tech. But it's all tech focused. And then, of course, gas lamp fantasy. It's a, it's a fantasy genre. And when you get a blend, well, all of a sudden you're writing um, <laughs> science fantasy. And it's really it's it's whether it's about which one is more important where you put mm -hmm. it in the in the space. I think gas lamp fantasy commonly has steam elements in it as well. I think that that's something that I have seen quite often. It can, um, but because it is such a wide category, it's one of those things that can be included or not. 
my advice to people is always not to worry about what genre you're writing until after you've written it and you need to describe it to somebody. Because it yes. is at heart a marketing term. It is not a writing term. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, Joella Kay says, so Lord Darcy novels of the 90s would be Gaslamp. Yes, that is one of the Absolute. examples of Gaslamp that I have as well. Yeah, I love those books. They were deeply influential on me as, as a younger reader. Very interesting. Uh, Emily Armstrong says, I absolutely needed this stream. I'm starting to realize that my world might be gas lamp and not steampunk. Yes, I think it might be. There's a lot of magic in your world, Emily. Um, so we've talked about gas lamp fantasy versus steampunk. What about another term that tends to come up? What's the difference between gas lamp fantasy and flintlock fantasy or gunpowder <laughs> fantasy? Oh, now we're getting to splitting hairs. Um, I would say, and I, I will get argument from like a dozen different writers on this. Um, it's how we have fun. I would say gaslamp fantasy is cultural in a lot of ways. You're talking about the culture that you're writing in. Flintlock fantasy, gunpowder fantasy is more specific to the type of story that you're writing. Uh, tends to be more based on military exploits or adventure, whereas Gaslamp fantasy tends to be a little bit more character-driven, mystery-driven, um, romance-driven. So really, yeah. there are they're complementary terms, not conflicting terms. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think if it's flintlock fantasy or gunpowder fantasy, as you say, there's often an emphasis on flintlocks and gunpowder it's right there in the name <laughs> it's about military exercises it's what military sci-fi is to this era essentially yes, um in a way so. that steampunk is the sci-fi version flintlock fantasy if, or gunpowder fantasy is the military the military sci-fi version but put in a 19th century construct if I, if i were going to draw uh comparisons i would say that uh, flintlock is the space opera of period fantasy <laughs> I love that. I love that. That is very insightful. Um, the other thing that's interesting about uh, gas lamp fantasy or flintlock fantasy is it tends to go back a little bit earlier. So you see mm -hmm. uh, people drawing on the 18th century as well. There's there's a big, yeah. um, because a lot of genres are very American drawn, there's a big influence of the um, the American Civil War, but there's also a big influence of the American War of Independence on a lot of that stuff. And actually one of the earlier works by Brian McClellan, powder mages heavily influenced by revolutions mm -hmm. and the american revolution we actually have a podcast about flintlock fantasy with brian mcclellan in our back catalog folks so if you're you want more information about flintlock fantasy we do have that available for you as well um yeah it's a it's a it's a very as you said it's a very different story focus isn't it it's much more much more high high adventure a little bit more pulpy yeah it, it goes back to um again what you what story you intend to tell um and again there there if i can't emphasize anything enough it's that there is no hard and fast rule nobody can say this is what you are writing you are not writing the other thing uh, because there is so much crossover it is a very large playground and people should feel free to to take whatever works for them and make it their own that's the fun part of all of this uh, God knows, like I said, uh, Huntsman books are set in 1913. So they have automobiles, they have electricity, they have modern toilets, which is really important. And I spent way too much time researching what toilets were like in hotels in 1913. Oh my God, this is useless knowledge. I will never hopefully need again. Uh, the rabbit holes we fall down are amazing. But because of that, I was sort of stretching gas lamp into a uh, gilded age fantasy yeah um but it doesn't matter i could do that we're allowed to do that kind of stuff absolutely can you unpack that term for me gilded age fantasy i think that's one our readers will want our uh, listeners will want to hear more about gilded age the gilded age is uh basically um 1911 ish to first world war pretty much um it is, uh, oh God, now I'm blanking on the name of the most famous story set in the Gilded Age ever, multiple movies, 
The Great Gatsby. Oh, the Great course, Gatsby yeah. is Gilded Age. It's um, upper class. Everything's going great, while underneath everything is not going great. Uh, I got to write about labor conflicts, um, women's suffrage, all of that. At the same time, the wealthy were having fabulous times, and it's it's a great it's a great period. But it is at the edge and the of what we consider gas lamp and the start of a different period. So you can, you can reach back for Flintlock or whatever prehistorical uh, pre-period, or you can reach forward and bring those things in because that those um, smudging period definitions or, or distinctions is half the fun. Yes, absolutely. And I would say that if you're writing in a world that is not first world, it's not this earth you can do even more with that you can smudge even further because you are not yeah. beholden to the to the rules of history or or alternately if you're writing in an alternate earth because yeah. uh, uh, things can have unfolded differently yeah a, a friend of mine Chaz brinkley is writing basically gas lamp uh fantasy set on mars oh fun so yeah <laughs> you can do whatever you want as long as you're internal world building is consistent absolutely um this goes back to, to suspension of disbelief if you build a structure that your reader can just kind of hang their disbelief on and go into the story you got this you're good yeah. that's the trick and it's a hard trick but it is possible so yes. we have mentioned already a whole bunch of examples of gas lamp fantasy what are for you some of the big iconic ones for you personally me personally, well, we already mentioned Lord Darcy, yes. which uh, Randall Randall Garrett, um, royal magician, quite wonderful. Um, Sherlock Holmes, obviously, is quintessential, and I know it's not fantasy. Well, it kind of is fantasy, um, but it has all of those tropes that we draw on. I'm sitting here looking at my notes. Um, Gail Carringer's Parasol Protectorate. Yeah. Absolutely, Very much that was so. one of the ones I was going to share. So, uh, yeah. for those who don't um, know, vampires, werewolves, and ghosts, but it's in a steampunk era. It's an alternate history. There's a, also a fascination with technology. So, for me, that really blurs the line between steampunk and gaslamp fantasy as well. Yeah. Also, a lot of comedy um, manners. Stuff. Yes, uh, Lilith Sinclair, um, Claire and Bannon, mm, which are fun, yeah. fun little books. Um, Jonathan Strand and, and, and um, Stranger and, and Mr. Norrell. Yeah. But also, and this is the one that always blows people's minds, but I have to remind you, Discworld is gas lamp fantasy. Yes. Yeah. He's doing it in a satirical sense, but he has hit every single trope. And it's brilliant. He understood that trope so well, he could completely send it up and make it work. Um, so if you're really interested in how to deconstruct that trope, you definitely need to read Discworld. Well, you need to read Discworld anyway, if you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think, are there any, there's so many others and a lot of recent authors and I, I would have to go and grab my bookcase and start pulling down books um, because I'm terrible at remembering people's names, but it is, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there, but those are the ones that really, to me, kind of linger in the back of my brain and inform what I do. I think for me, one of the interesting things I dug into novel examples. One of the ones I would add is Shades of Milk and Honey, uh, Mary Robinette Cowell. Robinette uh, Cowell, yeah. That was really fun. Um, yeah, I mean, and that was fa fa fascinating to me because it was sort of Regency, but it had a lot of kind of dramatic heroine stuff. And then it had this magical thread, but it was very much yeah. a, a blend of a comedy of manners, Jane Austen style thing and a personal romance sort of Bronte style thing mm -hmm. um which i thought was very interesting and then when you shift to things like tv examples there's things like arcane the the recent netflix show which was uh, absolutely blurred the line so you know the protagonist used steam powered machines to discover magic that's what happens in arcane um and i'm going to do a little leak here the executive producer of arcane is going to be speaking at World Building Con next year. So I just thought I'd share that with you guys. We we also have a if yeah, if you have if you're going to media Carnival Row. Yes, also on my list. Which absolutely. Is, yeah. 
one of my favorite shows ever. I thought I wasn't going in uh, and I was hooked. It's brilliantly done, brilliantly shot and manages to hit the, all the social elements of, um, of this period and also the problems of this period. And it's, it's great fun. And I'm really annoyed we didn't get another season. <laughs> There's another season coming. There's a season two. Oh, that, I thought, no, there is. I've already seen. Oh, I've already seen season two. Oh, okay. You're way ahead of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then no on spoilers. The end, no spoilers. No spoilers. But then on the far end, there's things like Bloodborne, which is a computer RPG, um, in which a hunter character explores uh what is essentially a gothic Victorian inspired city whilst fighting a bunch of hor horrific monsters because after all, it's a computer RPG. And I think what really struck me about all of these examples is there's this massive spread in tone from like really super dark gothic adventure all the way to comedy of manners, to romance, to I've seen liter uh, literature, not literature and latte. Um, yeah, literature and latte is the, the recent. Um, yeah, uh, that that's that uses that uses elements of it in a D and yeah. basically a D and D setting. Yeah, they yeah, do a kind of little mashup. setting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I've seen that quoted uh, as a, a gas lamp fantasy as well, and that's kind of the ultimate cozy fantasy story. So while there's a lot in common with all of these different elements, there's this huge choice that different creators are making from gritty, dark, penny, dreadful style stuff all the way to, you know, cozy coffee shop romance kind of stuff. It's it's a really fascinating job. I'm, I'm laughing I'm laughing here because when um Uncanny Times came out, I was tagged as dark cozy. Somebody actually started the hashtag dark cozy to describe it. And I was kind of like, yeah, that's me. I want a t-shirt that says dark cozy. Uh that's yeah. what I write. <laughs> that's a really good way of putting it. Absolutely. Um so I guess my next question, we've talked about some examples. We've talked about, you know, what it is and some of the some of the other genres that hover close to it in the nexus of genre descriptions, which is always a hazy, hazy nebulous space. What are some of the common, I don't just want to say tropes, but tropes, themes, elements, kind of story protagonist, story shapes that we see in Gaslamp Fantasy? This is a big one. Um, usually, there is um, even if the even if the story does not directly involve them, there is a royalty structure. It is very definitely class oriented, uh, which again ties back into the uh, Edwardian Victorian trope uh, history that we're stealing for this. Absolutely. There is a very rigid class structure whether that's being used or dismantled in the story is up to the creator, but that is one of the things that is pretty consistent throughout. Um, there is usually some sort of, um, if not a war going on, there is uh, a war having been had recently, because again, stealing from the actual history, this was what this, the society was looking for. Um, you also tend to get a lot of, um, how to put this, educational structure. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, the characters as a rule tend to be better educated because you've got the, the, the court magician or you've got the, um, you know, the, the, the noble family some sort of thing where they've gotten an education. It's not so much the the peasant or the 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 farm boy of other other genres. It's not the ordinary person. It is, or it can be a little elitist. And that's that is definitely a trope that you get to play with for good or for ill, whatever you want to do. Uh, Your start that's sort of a starting point for the society. Um, Magic as something that is common. Mm. Yes. It is not a secret society. Usually it's not something that nobody knows about, like we get in, in contemporary fantasy where it's a, a hidden magic. It generally is very much out in the open. It's common. It's bartered or bought and sold 
It's a commodity. So that's something to think about also. It is part of your economic system. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we look at common tropes, themes and elements of gas lamp fantasy, what we're really looking at is what are the big shapes in 19th century culture, but also in 19th century mm -hmm. literature, right? So what is important enough that it shows up on the pages of Dickens? What is important enough that it shows up on the pages of the Penny Dreadfuls, of the um, the things like Dracula and Frankenstein, which of course are, are also highly inspirational for this, this kind of genre as well. Um, I think, and those are things that we need to be very careful with because you know we we don't need to necessarily propagate 19th century yeah. uh, racism and 19th century classism, but if we were, we're trying to write in an authentic um, in an authentic 19th century space, all of a sudden this is something where you you have to start you know draw, drawing lines, making questions. How how do I deal with that? And I guess that takes me very neatly to my next question, which is the common pitfalls to watch out for in the genre, because who mama? Oh, oh, yes, they are there. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this, Laura Ann? Oh, oh I think you, you definitely touched on some of them, which is not examining um, the tropes that you're starting with, the racism, the sexism, uh, the classism, all of these things, if you just emulate them without examining them, and again, I'm starting to sound like an academic again, sorry about that. You're fine. Then your story doesn't come to life. Your world doesn't come to life. It's just, oh, you know, oh God, it's boring. Um, I think also it is very easy because there are so many absolutely fabulous examples that writers and creators tend to think, well, I have to do it this way. And as we've been talking about, no, you don't. Matter of fact, you shouldn't. The um, A pitfall that, that you also need to look out for, I think, and this personally got me uh, and took why the book took longer to write than it should have, is your choice of language. Yes. Um, there are many, many wonderful resources on the internet, thank God, where you can say, okay, when did this, when did this word become popularized? Uh, and you, it's not to say you shouldn't use a modern word. In fact, if you're going for that mashup, you definitely should. Um, the the gas lamp equivalent of a knight's tale. It's like, yes, go for the anachronisms, enjoy it, wallow in it. But if you want to keep it in that period, you have to be aware of your language choices of, not using modern terms, but also not every, there's a thing called the Tiffany problem. I don't know if, if, if you've discussed that previously. I've never heard of that before. Tell me about that. The Tiffany problem is if you name a character Tiffany, everybody assumes, oh, you know, that's silly. It's a modern name. Mm. It's actually not. Ah, huh, interesting. Um, it, it has been around forever. It's an abbrevi it's, it's a nickname for a longer, I think, Greek name. And it was common hundreds of years ago. Interesting. But the perception of readers today is, no, that's a modern name and it throws them out. So you have to be careful of that. Um, and it's, we were talking about this earlier. A lot of times a word is in a dictionary and so it says, oh, it was first used in this period. But you have to remember that for a book, for, for a word to hit the dictionary, it had to have been in common use enough that the editors of the dictionary decided it should be included. For those of us who are who are word nerds, you every year it's like, okay, what what new words have been added to the dictionary? What has been popularized to the point that they've been added? You have to basically give yourself five to ten years after it hits the dictionary yeah. um, for it really to be embedded in a culture um, and to, to show that it lasts, but also five to ten years before where some people might be using it, but it's not common. And you have to consider who your characters are. Would they use this word? Uh, this, again, rabbit hole, down. There's three hours of your life gone. Not that I've ever done that, ever, no. 
No, no, none of us. None, none of us world builders here have no. ever had a wiki dive, and I, I have never had to warn them set a timer when you open Wikipedia because otherwise your afternoon is gone. Yeah, um, and expectations also. Uh, what are what expectations do you have going into this world that actually don't work with your world? And this is the hardest thing when you're writing any kind of period fiction which is you want a thing to happen, but does it necessarily fit in the structure that you've given yourself? And yeah. this is, as an editor, I'm speaking, uh, I've seen this happen so many times to writers and I'm just kind of like, why did they do this? Well, I wanted them to do it, but it doesn't make sense in the world. And this, yeah. this in any genre, this is a problem, but specifically when you're working in a very clearly defined culture, Yes. Yes, absolutely. And um, having characters act as historical characters versus having like people people situated within that world, within that social construct, as opposed to having characters react like your readers might expect them mm -hmm. to not being so familiar with that social construct is a really difficult um, cognitive dissonance, because on the one hand, maybe there is a path that a modern reader would say, well, why doesn't she just do that? And that's something that you actually mm -hmm. have to cover in the internal dialogue to be like, but I can't possibly do that because, you know, that that would be against every social rule in my body. I That, that would be abominably rude. How could I possibly do that? That's one of the things that Mary Robinette Cowell does beautifully in her books because she is setting up this very stratified, structured society where characters have to behave a certain way and it's something that uh, we mentioned, um, Legends and Lattes, where they explode that. So yeah. those are two examples of how to, how to work within it and how to basically blow it out of the water. Yeah. And it's very interesting because this is actually a problem that is as wide as world building. This is a problem that is as wide as any setting, but yes. we really bump on it when we get to a setting that is real world familiar. That's where it really becomes an issue. We should always be thinking these questions, but we are forced to confront them in a very real, unrelenting way when some of our readers are more familiar with the era than the other, I think. Yeah, and for me, going from writing the Devil's West books, which were set in 1800 America that wasn't, where there, I was writing in a, in a period and a place where there were really no written records. Yeah. So I could make crap up, and as long as I made it sound believable, people just like, oh, OK, moving along. Um, and then to move into this more familiar, more modern period where people do have preconceptions and they do have expectations. And I had to sort of say, OK, now I have to play by somebody else's rules, too, uh, which was a fun challenge. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Yeah. Um... Any other common pitfalls for you? We've talked about language. We've talked about the social construct. Uh, for me, it was specifically talking about the magic that yeah. I used. Um, it had to be believable. It had to be consistent. And it had to fit into what people knew of this world. And there's always the temptation when you're creating a magic system to either go too big or too small. And when writing Gaslamp, I believe it's better to go small, uh, to have very focused magic rather than wild magic or, or any kind of um, unknown because it is a culture and a period where people were studying things, yeah. where people were writing things down, where there were schools, there, were, there was all of this stuff. It wasn't just some wizard off in the mountains that you had to go um, implore for, for help. It was part of the society. It was part of the culture. It had its own rules. It had its own structures. And the same thing for the Uncanny, for, for the Huntsman series, the the uncanny, the supernatural creatures that they're hunting had to fit into the world. I And it, for me, it was fun because I got to pull from um, legends and mythology all over the world. And because it was set in 
the US, I was able to bring a lot of immigrant supernaturals in, which was fun. But you have to make sure that it fits into that culture. If it is, if you're writing a land that has been colonized, you have to have both the native culture and and super, superstitions and magic and the colonizers bringing stuff in. Uh, I'm, I'm desperately waiting for the Australian uh, gas lamp fantasy that somebody in Australia needs to write because I think there's so much material there. Oh my goodness, but yeah. you need to create your magic that takes in these elements into play and use them. You can't just bring them in and then just let them sit there. It has to be an integral part of the world. And I think too many people throw too much stuff in. There's that temptation. It's like, well, if I can do whatever I want, if I can bring anything I want in, let's bring everything in. And I think that specifically in this genre and this subgenre is a mistake. We did a whole episode on um, kitchen sink world building. And one of the biggest issues there is, well, if you can have and vampires and werewolves and undead mm -hmm. and this and magic and everything, it's impossible to construct how those elements interact with each other in a sophisticated way and then everything just ends up a mile wide and an inch deep it's it's a very unsatisfying yeah. world that you create when you overstuff it because it, there's not enough space particularly in novels in rpgs you can have you know splat book after splat book after splat book but in in the novel structure there's not enough space to deliver that amount of world even if you have taken the time to build it out and i think that takes me very nicely too where do you start world building oh, God. for gas lamp fantasy where do you start it's uh i, I mean we we've talked for 40 minutes on this and so we show no signs of stopping it's a really interesting multifaceted genre so when you're creating a world for it where should you begin oh um that is an intensely personal question i think to every creator because some people start with a character, some people start with an idea, some people start with a setting, and it depends. For me, I start with characters mm. um, as a rule. In this instance, um, I started, um, the idea for, for, the, for the book came about, as I was joking before, 15 seasons of yelling at the TV screen watching Supernatural, <laughs> saying, your world building sucks. I love this show, but your world building sucks and you have no continuity. What are you doing? And a friend said, put up or shut up. <laughs> um, but I wanted to do something that was at the crossroads of culture yeah. um, where the things that live in the shadows were slowly getting pushed out by the light of electricity, by the light of a modern era. So for me, it was a combination of an idea and this is the right setting for it. And I think if you're going to go for a gas lamp, you need to start if not the first thing, the second thing needs to be, why am I choosing this particular setting? Yes. What about this culture, this, this um, structure is going to tell my story best? Is, is it, the, is it that, that stratification? Um, so I'd say, yeah, usually whatever, whatever your, your primary idea for the story, the second thing you need to consider is, um, why am I why am I choosing this particular structure? It can't just be because it's cool. I mean, that's yeah. always the reason why, but <laughs> it can't just yeah. be the reason why. Absolutely. Uh, for me, I think if you're choosing to write fantasy in an area that is an era that is so strongly infused with industrial revolution and technology and progress, like you said, you need to ask yourself why. You need to say, okay, but why magic in this era? What is their relationship? Mm -hmm. Are they the antithesis of one another? Are, is there a symbiosis there? Is, am I actually writing sci fantasy and it's it's steampunk, but there's also magic, like Arcane, for example? Or mm -hmm. is this is this you know two worlds at war with each other, the old and the new, like 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 what you're writing? You know, things are being pushed out the shadows by the the bright glare of the new electricity um and thinking about why this era why these problems i think is is critical yeah. i think another thing that's critical is deciding hidden world alt history or second world yes because that is a major yeah. choice if you decide hidden world you are saying 
it's my earth, but I'm hiding everything in the shadows underneath underneath the the pattern of society in the corners in the unexplored wildlands and again that that determines a lot of your themes if it's hidden where is it hidden because that tells you a lot is this man goes to wilderness to hunt monster or is this man un, un, unveils vampire in a masquerade these are these are very different kinds of stories one is an urban fantasy one is an adventure fantasy um and then you get into the alt history world which is I, I kind of want London, but what if it were way more cool? And then you can just write your <laughs> own. And then, of course, there's the second world where you just throw out everything um, and say, well, I just want magic and I want them all to be wearing frock coats. But also I want there to be magic. And also I want there to be weird things that nobody's ever heard before. And dragons. Yes. And dragons. Um, because we can't we can't not mention Naomi Novik. Um, of course. Temera. Yeah. Uh, also. One thing I would say is if you are doing um, our world, but not quite what I call sidestep fantasy, you don't have to give it all away at first. Yes. One of the best ways to build a sidestep fantasy, which is our world, but not quite, is to hide the details. Mm. When I was writing um, Uncanny Times, Uncanny Vows, all of the politics that they mention, everything that's going on is the actual history that was happening in those years. Uh, there is the shadow of World War II happening, World War I happening. There is um, union unrest. One of my favorite bits was writing them almost getting run out of town because the cops think that they're union organizers. Uh, and all of that gives you that realism and it, it resonates with readers who know the period or know enough of their history to be like, oh yeah, this is real. And then you kind of slip in the, the, you know, the, the, the vampires or the magic or whatever, but you don't have to do it all at once. Yeah. You can just leave trust and you can even start that. It sounds like a completely normal our world. And then all of a sudden there's something that, wait, what? There's a lot of opportunities to play there that you don't get in a clear second world fantasy where it's very obviously not our world. Um, and there's there's the only, you're using the trappings rather than, than the world itself. And if you're writing um, a historical urban fantasy, I guess the best way to put it for guess I'm, is in a hidden world, you have to be extraordinarily careful that you are hitting all the right historical notes. Um, and honestly, personally, I think that's not as much fun, but for the, the challenge for some people is uh, the joy of it. And then you have to be really, really, really sneaky about getting your magic in. Yeah, absolutely. I think another big consideration when you're thinking about gas lamp fantasy, particularly when you're thinking about telling, telling stories in gas lamp fantasy, it's something that you mentioned earlier. It's um, it's the class, it's the location in society, mm -hmm. because there are some gas lamp fantasy stories um, that really take place in the upper echelon of society. These are the Jane Austen style stories where it's it's all comedy of manners. It's it's like with like having conversations together. And then you get into things like the noir stories where it's, you know, it's a, a hard boiled police officer and he's interacting with all echelons mm -hmm. of society, both high and low. Um, and who you choose as your protagonists is going to define yes like who are they interacting with which parts of the society are you looking at looking at is it just going to be urban or are you going to be exploring other areas um one of the things that i found very nice about the gail carriage of solar series is that it started in london and we thought oh okay this is going to be an urban fantasy series that stays in the city then all of a sudden they end up on a dirigible exploring other places and it, it really takes it into a new space but they explore as outsiders so that is defining mm -hmm. their role and who they're interacting with and everything else they interact with a lot of border guards they inter interact with a lot of travelers and that's that's your world building in motion. That's defining what your setting is as far as your readers are concerned. So choosing the strata of society and the role in society, who, who, who's, who's going to be interacting and with whom, I think these are critical choices when we're defining yeah. the kind of stories we want to tell. 
And also, if you really want to open that up a little bit, having two point of view characters, I mean, the classic misfit matchup, if you have somebody from one class and somebody from another, not only are they going to have different viewpoints, but they're going to clash with each other, which creates a third viewpoint. And you get to really, without having to do the outsider point of view, um, you get to have your, as you know, Bob moments without actually having an Aussie Bob, no Bob moment. Uh, yes, and then they kiss. Yes, uh, <laughs> I saw that comment. <laughs> yes, sometimes. Uh, but it, it is another way to showcase the world that you're building. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that um, it makes such a difference, those those perspectives, those point of views, particularly if um, if you're writing a novel, particularly if you're in close third person, limited third person. So you're really inside the head of the character and you're, you're hearing the story and the, the observations through their voice that can give you a lot of breadth if you if you make clear choices between different kinds of characters from different situations. And in Gaslamp, especially in this Edwardian Victorian, uh, sorry, Victorian Edwardian range, um, gender differences are huge. Yes. Uh, if you can have alternating viewpoints in that, um, I had a lot of fun working with that and upending expectations. But because they were holding such different places in society, mm. your characters will see things and will observe things differently. And that widens the world for the reader. Yeah, absolutely. So we have unpacked a lot about Gaslamp Fantasy. We know kind of what it is, kind of where it comes from, a little bit about what it's not, uh, a lot of what goes into creating it um, and enjoying it as well. Now I want to ask you, what drew you personally to Gaslamp Fantasy as a genre for your Huntsman series? Oh, um, the politics. Interesting. And um, I'd mentioned before how I wanted it to be um, that sort of edging out the the gas lamp period into the the modern uh, Gilded Age. So there was a societal change happening, but at the same time, there was so much happening in the world. Um, the the tensions that were rising in Europe. Yeah. The shadow of World War One, which was evident in retrospect at the time, there was a major change in governance, especially in the U.S., the political parties, the union unrest. All of this was creating a society that was so tense and so um, polarized. And I'll be completely honest, at the time I was writing these books, we were also in a very tense, polarized world. And I was able to use these books in a certain way to highlight the similarities and raise some questions about who we are, what we think, what we're doing. Um, because my because of my background, that's kind of what I do in all of my books. I'm like, okay, I'm my job as a writer is to raise questions, not to give you answers. Mm. I want the readers to enjoy themselves, but I also want them to walk away with something sort of in the back of their brain going, huh, I mean, let me think about that. Um, and that particular period in American and in world history is just fabulous in a horrible mm. way. I mean, yes. absolutely horrible way. Uh, but there was so much going on. There was so much material for my characters to be impacted by that I couldn't not set it there. Um, the idea that they are trying to protect humanity while at the same time, they're basically blue collar getting shafted by the people with money, which actually Uncanny Vows uh, takes head on. Um, and the world is starting to kind of think that they don't need Huntsman anymore. Mm -hmm. And they really do just because modern age is saying oh that's not really a problem does not make the problem go away yeah so for me that was it was just all of these things I was like this is the only place I can set it that it will make sense fantastic and how has the launch of uh uncanny vows been again uncanny times you can find right now but uncanny vows is also now in the store right it came out on the 26th. yes it 
Uh, I, the 28th, actually, because for some reason known only to history, books launch on Tuesdays. Uh, oh. Came out on Tuesday. Uh, we had a big party at University Bookstore in Seattle. Um, for me, it's interesting because, and the audiobook is is now out. Uh, the narrators are amazing. I love them. Um, for me, it's interesting because I spend a year or more writing books, researching books, getting them out. And the moment they're launched, they don't belong to me anymore. They belong to readers. Yeah. So it's it's not like sending your kid off to college. It's like watching your kid graduate college. It's kind of like, go, you're on your own now. I hope you have fun. I hope you make good choices. But it's not my fault anymore. Uh, <laughs> so for me, a book release is literally a release. It's just like, okay, go, little book. Go into the world. Um, I hope you have fun. And I've already started working on the next projects. So if you'd asked me a week ago, my answer would have been very different. <laughs> That's so interesting. Uh, we had Tracy Hickman at last year's World Building Con talking about the power of world building. And one of the things that he said was uh, how when you release a book, readers come back to you and they tell you what they think your book is about. And it's extraordinary because yes. you wrote one book and they're telling you something completely different. And for them, that was the book. That was the experience. Like, and they they're have not wrong. Yeah, the book. exactly. I am. I am not a firm believer in the the author is dead philosophy. Um, but the author is in a corner with her coffee, just kind of watching. Yeah. You know, it's, it's whatever you get out of my book. It's partially what I put in there and partially what you brought into it. And that is the magic right there. That's, yeah. that's why we read. And that's why we Absolutely. write. Uh, I have some interesting questions here from our audience. Does Gaslamp Fantasy have to be set on Earth or can it be set on another world? Oh, it can completely can be set on another world. I mentioned uh, Chaz Brenchley, who was writing. Um, he's basically taking a old uh, children's series that he loved as a as a child, um, a, a chalet boarding school, I think mm. was the, was the series, and setting it on Mars. Oh, wonderful! Um, you know, you you can do that kind of thing. You can take that culture and move it anywhere. Yeah. Next up, we have, um, I once heard that Gaslamp Fantasy as a subtype of urban fantasy. Would you agree with this? Uh, I would not disagree with it. How's that for a diplomatic answer? I think that they are siblings. Mm. Uh, urban fantasy is simply says a fantasy set in a city in an urban setting. That's all it means. It does not, even though we, we tend to think of it as being very modern, it does not have a time frame attached to it by definition. Yeah. So gas, you can have a gas lamp urban fantasy, you can have a gas lamp rural fantasy. So I would say that they're not exclusionary, they're, um, they're joined. How's that for dodging the question? <laughs> I think that's great. I, I totally agree with you. I think gas lamp fantasy is a whole bunch of stuff that defines, as we said, technology level and magic and a, a bunch of tropes and themes and elements. And urban fantasy is a story type that revolves around a city. So they can absolutely yeah. be the same. And often they are. Um, we mentioned earlier, Victorian London is a very common place for gas lamp fantasy to take place. So yes, in that case, London often becomes, you know, one of the big looming characters within the within the space. Then it's absolutely yes, but it doesn't have to be. And I, I think your your uh, Uncanny Times is a great example of a gas lamp fantasy that is not urban fantasy. Like if you're yes. if you're looking for something else to check out, do check this out. I'm not just saying this, guys. I really have been enjoying this book very much. It is very enjoyable. I can recommend it. Um, and finally, Tail Cassis asks, do you think the term gas lamp fantasy helps with marketing or does it just make it more confusing to the reader? Um, yes and no. I think if somebody knows what they like, it is a useful identifier. If someone does not know they're going to like it, it can put them off. Uh, generally, marketing terms are not for readers. Marketing terms are for booksellers uh, and reviewers. And it's a lot easier to say, if you like so-and-so, you'll like so-and-so uh, for readers. I really wish that bookstores would follow the AO3 tags 
rather than genres, because it would be so much easier to find the books that you actually want to read. Um, you know, there's an entire section for there was only one bed trope. Um, but I, th I think it, you have to know the term for it to be useful. And if you don't know the term, it definitely can be confusing, um, which is why talking about what the term is and isn't is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you have any final advice for our world builders, writers, gamers who are considering exploring the world of gas lamp fantasy? Primary research. I mean, that's my answer to pretty much everything. Uh, <laughs> we mentioned Wikipedia before, but I'm I'm a trained historian, and I would say go to Wiki and then go down to the bottom and see what sources they cite, and go to them. Uh, reading first person if you can do it. Uh, getting reading history books, getting a feel for immerse yourself in what that world felt like, because that is where everything you write is going to come from. It's not necessarily something you're going to put on the page, but if it's in your brain, it starts to kind of percolate with your story and it's it adds the color commentary to the play-by-play -play for those of us who are sports fans. Um, it allows you to deepen the flavor of the world if you actually know what that period was like. Uh, and to piggyback off that I would say it can give you so much inspiration there is so there are so many crazy stories in history and that gives you so much inspiration for uh not not just for verisimilitude but really for like whole characters and crazy things that can and did happen in the past did happen that you can work into your story I always tell people the most unbelievable things in my books are usually the true things yeah, absolutely. Well, Laura Ann, I cannot thank you enough for joining us today. Thank you so, so very much. That was my pleasure. This has been a great fun. Oh, yeah. Well, for me too. And I do have to say, you've apologized several times for being academic. Never apologize with us. We are all <laughs> nerds here. That just makes you one of us, Laura Ann. Well, folks, this has been so very much fun. And of course, I wish you all of the best with World Ember, which is going on right now. 10,000 words of world building in December. I know you guys can do it. And I know that some of you have done it already. Good Lord, some of you have already finished World Ember. I don't even know how it's possible, but I'm very proud of you. And uh, folks, I've posted it in the chat a few times, but do go check out lauraangilman.net over on the internet. You can find all of her wonderful books. Uh, this will be released as a podcast. So if you're listening in the future, hey, how's it going? And uh, of course, we will be releasing a blog on unpacking Gaslamp Fantasy as well, as we do with all of these podcasts. So do go check out blog.worldanvil.com where you can find a ton of genre unpacking, world building advice, writing advice, and all that other stuff. I think we just released one on sword and sorcery that is really, really cool. Uh, that is all from us today. So we are going on a raid. Our raid shout is light up the forge. Shout it out as we get to Carson Druitt to let him know that we sent you. I wish you the most beautiful of Saturdays. And it only remains for you to grab your hammer and go world build. Talk to you soon, guys. Bye.